I'm Dan. Um, I'm going to be moderating today. And today we're joined by an incredible guest um, who a lot of you may recognize his voice, um, but you're going to be able to recognize his face today as well, Dr. Jason Ryan. Um, Dr. Ryan, as you a lot of you may know, is um, the founder of Boards and Beyond, which is an incredible um, board prep resource and also cardiologist. And he's going to be sharing with us uh, a little bit about maximizing success in medical school and on USMLE exams. So Dr. Ryan, I want to hand the floor over to you for you to go ahead and introduce yourself. Thanks, Dan. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining tonight. This is actually one of my favorite things to do is to talk to you guys informally. Um, for anyone who's pre-med or doesn't know, um, about 10 years ago, I built a website called Boards and Beyond, and I made short teaching videos to cover the topics that students need to learn for preclinical med school and the step one exam. So basic foundational topics like physiology and pathology and genetics and things like that. Um, and it started very small uh, in 2014 when I launched it, uh, but I kept chipping away and adding videos. And after a while and word of mouth, it sort of got bigger and bigger and bigger until it grew into this sort of gargantuan thing that it is today. Um, two years ago, I sold the company to McGraw-Hill, who I now work with, um, and we're still continuing to grow the website and try and spread it as far and wide as we can. Um, in January, I actually went to Dubai with McGraw-Hill. We have boards and beyond in medical schools in the Middle East, which was amazing to meet people from the Middle East who knew who I was and had heard my voice in my videos. Uh, I just got back from a trip to Switzerland where we went to a conference for European medical schools and Boards and Beyond is being used there. So it's really been a wonderful journey for me. And uh, I owe all my success to all the medical students who have subscribed to the website over the years and um, used Boards and Beyond and told their friends and colleagues that it's helpful to them. So I love to interact with you guys and love to talk to you guys. So this will mostly be an informal Q&A, and you can ask me whatever questions you want. I'll start with a short 10-minute presentation. These are some slides I made a couple of years ago when I gave a talk to some medical students on how to prepare for the step one exam. So, so if you're med students, you may already know some of this. Maybe some of this you won't know, and it'll be helpful to you if you're pre-med. This will give you a glimpse of what's going to happen when you get to medical school and the first major licensing you exam that you take, which is the USMLE step one exam, usually taken after two years of med school, you'll get a taste of what's in store for that. All right. So let's get started. If I can oops, click here. Okay. So the thing to know about the step one exam is that it's a test of mechanisms. And this is what makes it unique from every other test you'll take when you become a doctor. So most of the tests you take when you're a doctor including the step two and three exams and exams in your specialty, whether that's radiology or cardiology or surgery, those exams are mostly going to talk about management of patients. You know, a person is sick, what tests should you order? What drugs should you give? Should they be referred for surgery or not? That's how most board exams are. But step one is completely different. It's testing you on fundamentals of why disease occurs and why, how do medications work? And this is what can be frustrating for first and second year med students because many of your teachers are clinicians and they will teach you how to prescribe the meds and what dose to choose and things like that. Uh, and that's not what's on step one. So part of the reason I think Boards and Beyond succeeded, I didn't realize this at the time, but you know, because I spent so much time trying to figure out what was on the test and teaching to the test. So the videos are designed to go over all these mechanisms that you need to know even though those mechanisms aren't that relevant in clinical practice, and a lot of practicing doctors have long forgotten the mechanisms of how drugs work and things like that. But that, that stuff is all in the videos. Um, there are a lot of resources you can use to prepare for step one. Boards and Beyond is just one of many. And one thing I always tell students is there really is no recipe for a top score. The, the step one exam is now pass-fail, so it's not scored anymore, but there's no recipe that guarantees you a pass or not. Um, I've met students who uh, used a resource and swore by it. I've met students who used a resource and were very disappointed in how they performed on the test. Um, so you can, the good news about this, if you're a student is you can use whatever works for you. You'll hear your classmates and people above you say, oh, you have to do this or you have to do that. And there's nothing wrong with hearing that and trying out those resources. But if you're trying it out and it doesn't work for you, it's okay to just skip it. 
because I've seen everything skipped or used to a great extent and, and work out fine for lots of people. And like, if you go online, there's all these videos on YouTube and they tell you exactly how to study. And these things are fine if you just want to get an idea of how some people studied and what resources they use. But you should never let yourself be fooled into thinking there's a recipe for a perfect score. If there was, it would have been figured out a long, long time ago and every student would be doing it. What you're going to see is people using lots of different pathways to get to the knowledge base they need to pass the step one exam. So uh, <clears throat> this is just more summary of these points. Many pass to a stop, top score, no secrets. I wish I could tell you there's a secret and I could tell you two things right now and all of a sudden cardiology would be simple, but there's no way. You just have to spend many hours studying cardiology, getting it right in your mind. It's the only way to do it. Um, and people used to get great scores in the old days before all these resources existed. The average scores have gone up because there are so many resources out there, but that doesn't mean that Without these resources, you couldn't score highly. So there's lots and lots of paths for how to get to uh, the top. All right, here's one of the pieces of advice I used to say sort of casually, and it's been returned to me by more people than I can account saying it was the best piece of advice they got. So when you're studying for step one, this is an enormous exam. It determines uh, you need to pass it. If you don't pass it, it really narrows down your options for residency and training after medical school high stakes exam, stressful exam. Um, the more you talk to your classmates, the more it's gonna stress you out. Um, in the beginning, if you wanna ask your classmates what resources they're using just to get ideas of things to check out, that's fine, I suppose. But the, the students that spend a lot of time saying, here's what I'm doing, what are you doing? Are you doing more than me? Am I doing more than you? Am I doing less than you? Are you doing more than me? This stuff is going to just make your head explode. So the students I've seen navigate this step one test the best over the years, are students who basically just put their heads down and study and try to tune out the noise of what everyone else is doing. Uh, so I pass that on to you. I know it can seem comforting to talk to your friends about where you're at and try to find out where they're at, but ultimately I don't think it does you a lot of good. Um, memorization alone is not gonna get you a high score. So the board writers are uh, taught uh, and advised to write questions that really test understanding. So there's a much bigger emphasis on processes. So you will see some questions that are simply, do you remember whether this bacteria is gram positive or gram negative? But you're gonna see a lot more questions that want you to apply whether the bacteria is gram negative or gram positive to know how that fits into the bigger picture of microbiology and what it means for medicine. So there's a big emphasis on practice beyond simple memorization. Um, I've taken like I think nine board exams because all the steps and I recertified medicine, I recertified cardiology. So those I took twice and I took echocardiography and nuclear cardiology. And in all these exams, no matter how much I had studied and went into the test thinking I'm ready, within the first few minutes, I'd see a question where I just said, WTF, what the heck is this? <laughs> I have no idea. I don't even understand what their what their topic they're testing. Like this is bizarre. I remember my echocardiography free board seeing an echo image. I had no idea what it was showing, even if the heart was right side up or upside down. It was so confusing. And so I tell this to you because I really think passing board exams, a lot of it has to do with self-confidence. When you get that first question that isn't a slam dunk, that isn't easy for you, it's not something you've seen a hundred times before, it's easy to panic. And to go, oh my God, you know, they shouldn't have let me into med school. It was freak luck that I got in. And now I'm being exposed. And all my classmates probably know this answer, but I don't know it. But that's not true. So you're going to have to face questions where you're totally lost in every board exam. And you're just going to have to use good judgment. You know, you're going to have to say, okay, look, answer A is ridiculous. That cannot be correct. Answer B is also ridiculous. Okay, now I'm down to three choices. Let's see which one makes the most sense. This happens on every exam, no matter how prepared you are when you go in, there are just too many topics, too many ways to test them for you to go in having seen everything and just knock every question right out of the park. Along those lines, guessing is a huge part of board exams, all right? So this is an exercise that I saw someone at a board review course go through and I've always shared with students. So. Let's suppose 75% of the questions on your exam, you can answer easily. They're straightforward. They're things you've seen before. No problem. You answer them. And 25%, you have no clue. And you just guess it at 25% and you get them all wrong. Well, you're going to get 75% right. Now let's imagine 50% of the test you answer easily. And the other 50%, you narrow down to two answers and then guess. 
Well, you're going to get 75%, all right? So the idea here is that if you narrow answer choices down, you are more likely to be correct when you guess. And like I said on the last slide, you cannot be ready for everything you're going to face. There's going to be guessing. So take a deep breath when you see that question that you don't understand. Use your brain, use all the things you've learned, all the foundation you've built, cross off wrong answers and narrow it down. And because that way, when you guess, you're more likely to be correct. Okay, so preparation for the step one exam occurs months and years before the test. There's too much information on this test to learn it in the six weeks before the exam. You need to study hard in your courses. You need to review board material alongside your courses. Take time when you're far away from exams and you have some time in your hands to read primary resources like journal articles or textbooks and really build up a strong foundation. That's what puts you in the position to then use the four or six or eight weeks before your test to really push yourself into the range where you're going to pass. It's very hard if you wait until a month or two before the test to start building your foundation. There just isn't enough time. I think the step one exam takes about six months to prepare for studying most days of the week give or take. Some students could do it faster. Some might take more. So, you know, you really need to begin building your foundation of knowledge and physiology and pharmacology and pathology months before you take the exam so that you're in a position to use those weeks before to really just fine tune all your information. Most schools have a dedicated study period. When I was in med school, dedicated study was two weeks. Um, now, I think most schools, it's six or eight weeks. And this is great. Uh, but it also can can fool you, right? You can think, well, I have that six weeks of, of no classes before the exam. I'll, I'll study everything then. It's not enough time. You need to go into those six weeks already with a foundation. But if you do that, then what you can do in dedicated study is do lots and lots of practice questions. And the good thing about dedicated study period is key facts will stick, right? If you memorize right now all the names of the RNA viruses uh, and you take your test a year from now, you won't remember any of that a year from now. It will all spill out of your brain because you don't use that information. But if you memorize those bacteria, those names uh, two weeks before your exam, it will probably stick. So that's where dedicated study is really useful for drilling questions, putting in fine facts that you may remember forget quickly, but they'll stick until the exam. All right, and then the last thing I like to share with all of you guys is that your board scores are not your destiny. Uh, there's lots of students who have struggled to pass their step exam or when it was scored, who got a disappointing score. And they're now chiefs of surgery, chiefs of medicine. They have great careers. They're loved by their patients. Um, I, I really, it was really eye-opening to make videos for all the topics for step one when I initially created Boards and Beyond. And it was sort of an epiphany for me to realize how nutty this test is. I mean, it tests you on so many detailed things that no doctor knows. And so what that means is you can struggle with this test and become a fantastic physician. And you can also, there are students who find the test not that hard, right? They're great test takers, but they struggle when they get into clinical rotations because that's a different skill set, right? It's talking to patients, it's talking to your attendings, it's being a member of a team. So lower the stakes for yourself. Don't let yourself believe that this test is a judgment on the type of doctor you're going to be or your general worthiness for the career in medicine. That's not the case at all. This test is a rite of passage. It has some value because it teaches you foundations in medicine that you'll need to learn later, but there's so much learning and so much medicine that comes afterwards that whether you do great on this or whether you struggle with this, there's still plenty of time for your career to go in totally different directions once the test is over. All right. so. This is just a couple examples to show you the type of questions you get in step one. I won't go through the whole question, but this is a crazy, I think it's a UWorld question. It talks about a patient with abdominal pain and there's a hundred different things going on, right? Uh, he was at a party. He did some kind of weird physical thing with other people. He owns a dog, a cat, a parrot. He travels frequently all this crazy stuff, and then they want you to know the causative pathogen. And this is the typical kind of thing they can ask you for step one. They don't want you to they don't want you to know what test to order for this person. They don't want you to know what drug he's probably going to need. They don't want you to explain his prognosis. They just want you to recognize what his diagnosis is. And this is another question. This is from the Boards and Beyond Q Bank. 
It describes a classic patient who has hypothyroidism, very common clinical problem. But in clinical medicine, what you worry about with hypothyroidism is, well, what test do I order? What treatment do I order? Uh, what's the prognosis for the patient? But none of those things are going to be asked on step one, very likely. Instead, they just want you to know that there are lymphocytes infiltrating the thyroid gland to cause this condition. And, you know, this is a kind of thing, if you went to an endocrinologist, they might not even know this because it just doesn't come up in clinical practice. But for this step one exam, that's what they're going to say. What's going on inside the tissue of the thyroid gland in this person with this common condition, all right? So I think that's all I've got. I'm going to let uh, Dan take over and talk a little yeah. bit about med school coach, and then let's open it up and talk about whatever you guys want. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Dr. Ryan, for sharing all that. It's very helpful. And again, for everybody watching, make sure you're using that Q&A function at the bottom to write in your questions directly to Dr. Ryan. Um, and then a little bit about med school coach too. So thank you so much, Dr. Ryan, for doing this with McGraw Hill and boards and beyond. And what med school coach can offer is if you're studying for the USMLE exams and you're interested in tutoring services one on one with an individual tutor, med school coach is perfect for that. The goal is to help you become a full blown physician. Um, and so whether it's studying for the MCAT, studying for the USMLEs, or advising services to get into medical school, uh, med school coach offers all of those things and more. So, um, and we can go on to the next slide, Dr. Ryan, too. Okay. Um, and it's all about getting paired with the perfect person who can help you succeed. And at the end of the day, there's so much to do to do well on these exams. So having somebody in your corner is always super helpful. And we have one more slide. Um, you can go to the next slide. And this is a, a QR code you can use if you're interested in booking a meeting with somebody from Med School Coach. Um, but the question that I have for you, Dr. Ryan, to get started with questions before we go into all of the Q&As, can you tell us a little bit more about how you became essentially like an educator? Like, how did you get into education in the medical school space? Was this something you were always interested in or did this sort of just snowball like you were talking about earlier? How did you end up where you are today as one of the honestly biggest educators in the medical space in the world? Sure. Um, so in, I always like to teach. I don't really know where that came from. You know, maybe I like the attention of students or, you know, who knows what, but, you know, I always like to teach and i like to think about things like, like when I would go to a lecture in med school and it'd be very confusing in my head, I'd be thinking, why is this confusing? You know, is it the words the person's choosing? Is it the way they're drawing it? How, and then once it sort of clicked for me, I would think, well, how could that person have said it easier? So this was just always sort of my thing. And I was a chief resident at Beth Israel Deaconess in training, and I did a lot of teaching as a chief resident. So when I became an attending, I had all these PowerPoint slides on lots of topics, a lot of cardiology topics because I'm a cardiologist, but as a chief resident, I gave talks on hypercalcemia and thyroid disease and you know inflammatory bowel disease. So I had all these PowerPoints. Um, so I was teaching in med school. I took a job at the University of Connecticut out of fellowship, and I was teaching medical students. We had a lecture-based curriculum then. And I gave a couple of lectures, but I always felt like I could teach a lot more. But, you know, the curriculums in med school are broken down. Certain faculty teach certain things. It was established. You know, I couldn't just teach whatever I wanted. Um, but luckily, you know, the Internet came along. And around 2014, one of my students showed me Pathoma, which you all may know. It's a, another mm -hmm. video educational website for students. And I was blown away by it. It was the videos were simple. Uh, the strength is not in the high techedness of the video. It's in the power of the explanations from the narrator. Uh, Dr. Sitar, who makes those videos, is a very good explainer of medicine, a lot like I feel like I am. So that gave me the idea to say, well, maybe I should make my own website and then I could make videos on whatever I wanted. And I already had all these PowerPoints ready. So that was sort of the light bulb moment is, is some of my students showing me Pathoma and telling me. I should make something like this for the topics that I teach. Uh, initially, I started the website just in cardiology, but then requests came in, can you teach more? And I taught renal physiology and pulmonary physiology. And you know, eventually I just got this bug where I loved relearning these topics and teaching them. And I asked colleagues for help to make the slides. And then once I got the slides, I made the video. And you know, here we are 10 years later, it's been a wild ride. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's great. And it's super helpful to be able to hear something explained kind of like in a simple way that makes sense. Because a lot of there's so much information and then hearing it directly, like in a straightforward way is very helpful. And getting into the Q&A now of what people are asking. So for example, Josephine's writing, 
that um, Josephine's a second year medical student. And mm -hmm. there is sometimes discrepancies before between what a medical school teaches and kind of what their exams look like. And then what board preparation looks like. The materials aren't exactly the same. The slides aren't the same. The information is similar, but again, not the same. So what is a way to kind of balance that? If, if you know, you're talking to a first or second year medical student who wants to do well on their board exams, but also obviously wants to do well in school on their school exams, how, do, how would you suggest kind of balancing those two things? Right. This is a really common problem. So what happens at a lot of medical schools is uh, you'll have a lecture on, you know, coagulation. Um, but the person who gives the lecture uh, maybe is a bone marrow transplanter and gets into all this detail on hypercoagulability in the setting of bone marrow transplant patients day 14. And that stuff is not on step one. So what are you going to do? Um, well, you have to pass your med school classes. So you can't completely ignore what the what's being taught in your classes. You have to do those things. But I think what I've seen the students who do well on step one do is in, they learn what they need for their med school classes, To but in parallel, they're watching a Boards and Beyond video or they're doing uh, some questions from a step one Q bank or something like this so that they make sure I'm learning what I need for class, but at the same time, I'm learning what I need for the boards. I wish that didn't happen. I wish more schools would focus on step one and even back when I was in med school, I used to wish my teachers would teach more to step one. Some of them did, but some of them didn't. And that still happens. And it's an unfortunate thing that, you know, as a student, you have to juggle these two things. On the one hand, learning what you need for classes and your class exam. And on the other hand, learning what you need for step one. But most med schools, even though they may not teach to step one, the topics they cover mirror the topics of step one. So you may get a lecture on the liver that goes into liver transplantation and all these things you don't need to know for step one, but they're still teaching you the liver. So when you're learning that in parallel, you can watch the boards and beyond video on the liver or use some other foundational resource. And that's really the way most students get through those first two years. If their curriculum doesn't sort of match more closely to what's on step one. Yeah. I think that's good advice. Like matching the board prep resources, what you're actually doing in, in the medical school um class like you said if you're learning about the liver then do the board prep for the liver as well at the same time and that way you can kind of knock things out as the year goes and you can strengthen those that knowledge base as you're learning it um so thank you so much for that answer and um miguel asks a little bit more about that pass fail kind of change with step one why do you think step one ended up changing to pass fail and what are the implications of that what have been some of the changes that we've seen as a result and kind of what are your overall thoughts about changing board exams from score based to pass fail in particular step one right now yeah this is a really interesting history so when step one was scored which was only a couple of years ago now i don't know three or four years ago um it was getting almost out of hand like students would be accepted to med school and would start studying for step <laughs> one you know they hadn't even walked through the door yet and Faculty, you know, now that there's so many resources, right, and the more people felt like the more of these resources they use, the higher their score will be. So literally from day one of med school, there were students prepping for step one because a high score could mean a career in a competitive specialty like dermatology or ophthalmology, or orthopedics, and a low score could mean that those specialties were off the table. So the step one exam was sucking the oxygen out of medical education. You know, students were blowing off clinical skills, right? Because clinical skills, which are hugely important to medicine, are not on step one. Uh, so, so a lot of med schools were frustrated by that. Uh, and I also think for the students, the pressure was really reaching a, a critical mass. I mean, people were studying so hard for so long to just try and bo boost their score up three or four points. So the test moved to pass fail. And a lot of people thought, oh, what a relief this is going to be. Now that it's pass fail, students can actually breathe and they can just focus on school. But what you found is the test is still really hard. It's not scored and that's nice, but it's still a very, very difficult test covering a vast amount of material. So when it first went past fail, there were a lot of students who said, well, I'll just study for the six weeks of my dedicated study period and I should pass. And we saw a lot of failures. Um, and more than fa failures are bad, of course, but also what happens a lot is students just defer the test. So 
their school says you have to take it by May 15th so you can start your clinical rotations. And on May 14th, 20 students are in the dean's office begging for an extension because they think they're going to fail if they take it tomorrow. And when schools grant those extensions, it disrupts your, your, your rotations. You know, you're supposed to be scheduled to start surgery, to start psychiatry, but you can't because you're studying for step one. Um, and it, there have been crazy situations where students have actually had to take an extra year of med school to prepare for step one because they needed so much time. So that's the pickle that we're in now is it's pass fail. So nobody's gunning for the highest possible score like they were before, but how much studying is enough? It's really hard to know. Most medical students have never taken a pass fail exam. Everything's graded from organic chemistry to calculus to physics in college. Um, so I think this is where people find themselves in a bind right now. And that's why I think what we just talked about, which is as your school covers topics, physiology, pathology, pharmacology, you learn what the school teaches you, but at the same time, you keep one eye on step one and say, what does step one want me to know? First Aid for the Boards is a great book for this. It gives you everything you need to know for step one. It's linked to Boards and Beyond now. So if you watch a video, you can click a button and see the page in First Aid pop up digitally. Um, but you keep an eye on First Aid and say, okay, my professor is emphasizing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but there's Hodgkin's lymphoma and there's this lymphoma. It's all in First Aid. So you learn that at the same time. And that way, when you get to that dedicated study period, you're ready to just drill questions and prepare yourself for the exam. Okay, so that makes sense. It sounds like not necessarily, you know, a certain amount of time before the exam that you should start prepping. It's really use resources in conjunction with school lectures in medical school. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of schools do offer that like six week window of um, of a dedicated study period, which is helpful. But you can't leave everything until the end. Otherwise, there's too much of a risk that you might not get to a passing score because the exam is not easy. It covers pretty much all of like medicine. No, I mean, there's there's so much material on this test. I, I really feel badly for you guys. I mean, I had to do it. It's a rite of passage. You will be able to do it. You will get through it, trust me. But it is just a huge amount of material. You know, it's hard to go into one eight-hour exam knowing everything from genetics and immunology to cardiology and HIV and ICU medicine. There's just so much there. And so you just have to find a way to get it right in your head and then drill a lot and then have a foundation so you can drill a lot of questions leading up to the exam. Yeah, absolutely. It's, do you think that there's an actual like percentage that people, like I saw some questions in the Q&A, like is there a certain percentage of questions, right, people need to aim for, or it's really impossible to know just because it kind of changes based on the curve every time people are taking the exam? Like how does somebody truly know if they're ready? I guess is it just practice exams to take first to kind of get a good sense of how prepared someone is? So most med schools, I, I don't know the exact number, but most med schools don't want you to fail. And they have a track record of students who have failed versus students who have passed. How are they scoring on the MBME practice exams and things like that? So if you're getting scores that aren't great on those tests, I would advise you to talk to the people at your school and find out if they can help you understand where you stand. I know at University of Connecticut, for example, you know they, they will be honest with you about if you're getting, I think it's around 64% or 5% on some of the MBME tests that historically that means you're going to pass if you're above that. And if you're below that, you're at risk of failing. They can even tell you your likelihood of failing versus passing. Um, so I think that's a good place to start. I don't know an actual number, I, but you know, generally the students that are getting 80, 90% at MBME tests usually say, I'm ready, no problem. Yeah. Students are getting 40, 50% are usually very worried and they're somewhere in the middle where, you know, is a gray zone. Yeah, and it's just so important to pass these exams just because they feel sometimes like hurdles in our way. But at the same time, the material that we're learning, you know, you mentioned a few things like sometimes when people are attending, they might forget some mechanisms and things like that. Why do you think those all of those things are tested? Is it just to build foundations or to build understanding of medicine? Why put so many details on the exam? I remember studying for step one and feeling like I had to know so many like genetic mutations and parts of cell cycles and pathways that it didn't feel like it was going to be relevant later on. Why do you feel like those pieces of information are tested if they're not necessarily fully clinically applicable later on? Yeah, that's a great question, which like, you know, we could go out for a beer, Dan, and talk about for like three hours. <laughs> um, there, there are a lot of things on the step one exam that are historical. So 
once upon a time, they were cutting edge. You know, when people discovered these genes associated with cancer, they someone won the Nobel Prize. Now it's just one of 500 different genes that cause cancer, but it's still being tested. Um, some things are valid. I mean, like the clinical presentation of rare diseases, I think is worth memorizing because there's a lot of stories of doctors who saw some presentation and somewhere in the back of their mind said, oh, this sounds like, you know, botulism, which I learned in med school and they were right. So, so that might be okay, but knowing all the details, uh, I don't think is worth it. At the meeting I was just at in Switzerland, the there was an, uh, a USMLE booth. And I went up to the two reps who were there and I said, you know, are you guys aware that this test is so huge? It's an enormous burden on students. It stresses people out. It probably contributes to burnout. And a lot of the information is outdated. Do you have any plans to update it or change it or make it open book? And they just sort of looked at me and blinked a few times. I mean, I don't think they have any any plans to change it. The, the questions are written by volunteer faculty. I don't think the faculty that do this are super clinical busy faculty. I think they're more basic science type faculty and there's a lot of PhDs, but they feel like the test is written by doctors. So it must be valid and we need to test you on hard things. So we make sure that we don't let, you know, people who aren't good at science get into the profession. So so I, I was really a, actually a, a revealing conversation for me because I just felt like, well, this test is not going anywhere. It's it's going to stay like it is for some time. And it just is how it is. You know, there's some things on there that are really clinically relevant. You know, there are EKG findings that I see all the time. And I say, oh, I'm glad they're testing you on this. And then there are other things where I say, boy, you know, I treat this disease every day and I didn't even know this fact. I don't know why they're testing you on it, but it is uh, what it is. Right, fair enough. And and we talked a little bit about that, the nature of step one going pass fail. But step two is still scored. So with step one being pass fail, I mean, doesn't that kind of just push the burden of doing really well on one exam to step two, which is taken much closer to when a student's actually applying for residency positions? It does. Uh, and it's unfortunate because, you know, you take step two is taken usually at the end of the third year, beginning of fourth year, right around the time you're applying for residency. So you can have your heart set on, you know, ophthalmology, and then you get a, a poor score on that step two exam. And all of a sudden you can't get any interviews in ophthalmology and you have to change your whole career path. It used to be that you knew after step one, sort of what competitive spots you were eligible for. So you went into your third year with that in mind saying, okay, I scored really well. I'm a competitive applicant if I wanna do something that's very difficult to get into, or I didn't get a great score, so I can't do the super competitive specialties. Now you don't find that out till right before you apply. And that is a bummer for students uh, for sure. Uh, that, but that's just the way the system is right now. And like I said, you know, it's really, it's really controlled by this black box of, of people who run the USMLE. And I don't think it's gonna change anytime soon. Right. And and like you mentioned, these these tests are they have such a high impact on future career and they're just so important. And that's why we're even having this webinar to explain like there are amazing resources out there to to help tackle this. And that's why Boards and Beyond is so helpful. Are there other, you know, you mentioned first aid, right? You we talked about boards and beyond in particular. Um, are there other like core resources that you think are important to use, or are there kind of ways to study? Because one thing that's super kind of popular now is spaced repetition, like Anki flashcards and things. Are there certain things somebody definitely should be doing to prepare and certain resource someone should, resources someone should definitely be using? I wish I could tell you an answer to that that was accurate, but I've talked to so many students who've succeeded in so many different ways. There are students who say, I never would have passed step one without Anki. And there are students who say, I absolutely hate Anki. I never touched it. And I've done great on step one and step two. And now I'm a dermatology resident. Um, and I'm not one of those people. I mean, I made boards and beyond as the type of resource I would have liked as a student. And if I were a student now, I'd be using boards and beyond because it teaches the way I like to learn. But I am aware that there are students who don't like the videos. They find them, they don't remember them. They find them boring. Uh, and they find some other resource more helpful. So, you know, what I usually tell people is, you need some kind of foundational building resource like videos, textbook, whatever. Amboss has all these study sheets and study guides you can read through. Pathoma has videos. You need something to build your foundation so you know the underlying science. And then you need some type of practice question resource. 
And you know, the big ones are UWorld and Amboss. Boards and Beyond has a question bank too, uh, which most people use right after the video to just test themselves and see if they learned what's in the video. But you know, that combination of a foundation building resource and questions is what most people do. But exactly which one you use, I've seen so much variability. And I've also seen so much stress among students saying, everyone's telling me I have to use Sketchy and I don't like Sketchy. And I say, don't, don't use Sketchy. Oh, but I heard I'll, I won't pass without it. No, no, no. You can definitely pass without it. You know, you can pass without Boards and Beyond. You can pass without UWorld. You can pass without First Aid. It can happen. So you have to find what works for you. And everybody's just different in this regard. Yeah, fair enough. And, and Kiana just asked in the chat, does First Aid come by default if you purchase Boards and Beyond? Or you said it was sort of linked? It's so first aid, there is a digital version of first aid now. It's called first aid forward. Uh, and it basically has the text digitized and you can search it and highlight it with your mouse. Um, and when you watch a video, you can click and see the page of first aid that goes with that video. If you want to have the whole access to digital first aid, I believe that's a separate subscription, but you can see the part of it associated with each video. Okay, great. And I'm looking more into the Q&A. So everyone just make sure you're dropping questions into the Q&A and we're trying to get to as many as possible. But I see a question from Alice who asked about advice for studying for these types of exams, whether it's you know a, a board exam or something like the MCAT even. And there are so many distractions now, right? There's so many, you know, you could be on your phone, you could be doing other things. There's so many things to be doing, right? Like how, like, what advice would you have on staying focused in preparation for these exams? Because that is such a critical aspect of it. I remember when I was in medical school, I would sit in the little, like the little cubicle and just put the, away the phone in a locker and just study from morning till night. But there are so many distractions and it's really hard to do that. I don't even think I'd be able to do that today. How would you recommend somebody like stay focused and like not get distracted? Oh boy, that's a great question, but it's really hard to give like a one size fits all answer for it because we're all so different, you know? Um, uh, definitely this whole thing about like mindfulness and being able to tune out the world and not be constantly checking your phone is like this massive modern issue that we all sort of struggle with. And uh, the best answer I can give you is to just tell you that, you know, you really have to look at yourself and see what works for you. Every, everybody's going to be different here. I mean, there's some people who have their phone like blowing up while they're studying and they're fine and they're still getting you world questions right. And there's other people who, you know, if their phone's even in the room with them, they they can't study because they're constantly wanting to go and check what's happening on their Instagram account or something like that. So you really got to just take some time to look at who you are and what works for you. Uh, I don't have a, a clear answer to how to tune all those things out, but that's a huge challenge in the modern world for sure, for everyone, even me, you know, today I was trying to uh, update a video. I was working on some slides and, you know, I kept getting texts from my kids in school asking me questions and I ended up not getting much work done. It just happens to all of us. Right. And so with that being said too, there's preparation focus and then there's the actual exam focus. And when somebody sits for the actual USMLEs, right? Like that is a time to be incredibly focused too. Um, and with that being said, there's there, you know, everything's timed, right? So there are certain people who read questions faster and get through questions faster, but there are certain people who take longer to dissect questions and try to understand the material. And timing is such a big factor because you want to make sure to get through all your questions. If somebody um, is asking, and I, and I saw this question in the chat, if timing is an issue, and if it's difficult to get all of the questions in a block done within that amount of time, what recommendations would you have to speed things up or to kind of get faster at answering questions? I mean, I don't mean this as a plug for your company, but this is where like a coach could really help because everybody's so different. Um, uh, but I, I've worked one-on-one -on -one with students who either failed step one or were struggling to pass step one. And usually I say, bring me 10 questions from UWorld or NBME that you're struggling with and let's go through them together. And every time we do that, we uncover different things, you know, about what they're struggling with. Maybe they're focusing too much on reading the question. Uh, maybe they're misunderstanding certain words in the question, um, but probably the solution is going to be individualized to, to you. I mean, as a general thing, you need to practice with a clock. So you get used to the timing. Um, and you know that if you've spent two minutes on one question, you need to mark it and move on and come back to it later so that you don't end up spending 15 minutes on that single question. But 
there are so many unique things that could trip you up like that, you know, that I don't know that there's going to be a one size fits all answer for why someone is running out of time versus a different person running out of time. You could, you coach people. Maybe you see this more than I do about what, you know, causes yeah, students to have this issue. Absolutely. I think that individual aspect is so important of it. And there are courses that people can take and they're kind of like review courses and things like that, but there's nothing that's exactly the same as really sitting down with one-on-one -on -one with somebody and going through questions and going through the approach to questions because like you said this is i know kind of a repetition thing right you really have to get through a lot of questions get through the material get through a lot of the questions for practice and just reps but also if you're preparing in a way that isn't working for you then something needs to change right and I, that's where i think talking to an expert really is help, helpful to figure out what the best right. way to study I think, uh, hopefully you've all heard this before, but I always recommend reading the answer choices first. You know, there can, there can be a really long stem to questions. It can even be sometimes two or three paragraphs, but sometimes the whole stem is not that relevant. And the final question just asks you, you know, what genetic defect is present. So I, I always read the answer choices first that orients me as I read the whole question to know what they're looking for. Is this a question asking for pharmacology? Is this a question asking for microbiology or what have you? Um, but having said that, everybody's different. And some people will get stuck fixating on certain questions and certain parts of a question that can slow them down. So you really have to find out what it is for you specifically. Yeah, awesome. Definitely. And and I'm looking at a question here in the Q&A from Ibrahim, who's asking a little bit about kind of what we talked about earlier with memorizing versus understanding. And I think one of the key parts of Boards and Beyond is it, it's a balance of both, right? Because you have to know material, but you really have to understand it to know it because a question can pop up in 10 different ways for the same piece of information. So how do you balance kind of learning the material in the sense of like, I have to memorize this mutation in this pathway, but like actually synthesize it to understand it and be able to answer a question, whether it's asked like X, Y, or Z manner. Yeah. So I like to tell the story about my echocardiography boards on the echo boards. They test a lot of harmonics of waves and ultrasound waves and physics. Um, and I took that exam. And about a month later, I found one of my review books in my car. It had fallen under the seat and I opened it up and I had circled and start an equation. And I could swear for the life of me, I'd never seen this equation before in my life, <laughs> but it was clearly my writing and I had started. And I think that just reminded me of how quickly you forget like detailed information that you don't use. Um, so for fine detailed information, you're best memorizing that closer to the exam. Further out from the exam, you're much better off understanding general processes and principles and things like that. So that's the way I recommend people to study. So, you know, when you're far out from the exam, you just want to know, hey, there's, there's gram positive and gram negative bacteria and they have different cell membranes and they cause different diseases and you get those general principles down. The month before your exam, you can memorize exactly which ones are gram positive and gram negative, and that will probably stick. But I think one thing I see people doing is, is memorization is so soothing, like you feel like you know something. Aha, I memorized Staph aureus is gram positive. But if you don't use that information for the next two months or three months, you're going to just forget it. Um, even I've made videos and gone back to them years later, and I can't, I'm like, oh, how did I know all that back when I made that video? Because it's on a topic that I don't think about all the time. So I think memorizing and, and drilling fine detailed facts is best done two, four, six, maybe eight weeks before the test. Further out than that, you're much better off focusing on general principles. And this, this affects how you study. So let's say it's four months to the exam and you're doing an MBME question bank. And you see a question and you recognize this is giardiasis. I know it, it's caused by a parasite, but oh, I forgot the second line drug that's used in pregnancy. That's fine. No problem. You know, you'll you'll memorize that months from now, right before the exam. At least you know the big picture. You recognize what they're talking about. And I think that's the way to get ready. Further out from the exam, you're looking at broad principles. Do you understand what's happening in this patient's body in this clinical scenario? Close to the exam, drill those details so they stick in your head. Perfect. Um, looking again into the Q&A portion, Alexander's thanking me for Boards and Beyond, saying like, thanks so much. For You're welcome. This, essentially, but um, as somebody anonymous is asking about an extension option for Boards and Beyond, and that actually leads me to a question I have for you. When should a student 
start using Boards and Beyond? When should they buy Boards and Beyond? When should they kind of create a subscription? And uh, I mean, we talked a little bit about using it in conjunction with materials from medical school curriculum, but when should someone really start using Boards and Beyond? Because I, I think it's just such an incredible resource. And I really think everybody in medical school should be using it. And I will talk a little bit later about possibly it replacing medical school, but when should somebody be using Boards and Beyond or start using it? I mean, I... The students that have used it and really found it successful and have come back to me and said, thank you for making Boards and Beyond. It's because of you. I passed step one. I couldn't have done it without you. They've used it over the course of a year or more. There's just too much information to binge watch it in a month before your exam and have it stick. So the students that have told me it's been the most successful for them, you know, they did what I just described before. They subscribed beginning of first year or maybe second year. And whenever their school was discussing hematology, they watched all the hematology videos. And when their school was discussing genetics, they watched all the genetics videos. Um, so you can certainly buy it whenever you want and you know you can try to cram it in, but I think you're better off using it as like a slow burn where you watch a few videos every week or every month uh, and then move on to another topic the next week or the next month and use it sort of step-by-step step with whatever your school is teaching you. Fair enough. Um, great. And so. We'll, we'll keep looking into the Q&A. We have about 10 or so minutes left of this awesome Q&A. So thank you again, Dr. Ryan, for doing all this. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about kind of your thoughts on medical education. I know I just touched on it, but I, you know, the, it feels like medical school is changing. It looks like, you know, if a school is having their lectures posted online, or if there's an option to like go in from Zoom or, you know, go on to a webinar from home, feels like a lot of people aren't even going to class anymore, just watching videos from home and learning the material that way. What are your thoughts on that kind of trend in medical education, as well as, you know, these, like you said, like some of the lectures that we might get in medical school are very different from like board style lectures. The material might be very specific or niche and not necessarily fully applicable. What are your overall thoughts on like how medical school education is going to change in the coming years? Yeah, I get this question a lot. Um, so when I was in medical school, which is in the late 90s, um, and I wanted to learn a topic like hematology, my only resource was really a textbook. There, there weren't, there were some board review books which had bullet points of what to know, but they didn't really explain to you how things worked. If you really wanted to understand something, your only option was a textbook or a, a lecture. So even some of the lectures that weren't that good, I went to because that was one of two options I had for how to learn the material. And that's really where medical school was built. It was built around that idea that you needed a faculty member to translate the stiff, boring technical information in a textbook into plain English that you could understand and wrap your head around. Fast forward now to today, and you guys have hundreds of ways you can learn this, right? You don't need the faculty member. You've got Boards and Beyond and Pathoma, and you've got AMBOSS and sketchy medicine and a hundred other resources for how to use it. But medical schools are still built on that old sort of model. Sometimes the old model is okay. If you have a great lecturer who teaches to step one, you know, maybe you're really glad you've got that person. Uh, but other times you've got a person who's teaching at a really high level that you can't understand what they're saying. And you're wondering, why did I even show up for this lecture? Because I'm not learning anything from it. I think we're in a transition period. You know, I think when Gen Z is in charge of the medical schools and the dean, you know, was born in 2007. Uh, you know, at that point, probably a lot of this will look differently and people will be more open to saying, what do we actually need to do in person with our own faculty versus what can we just let the students go and learn on their own with some resource that we buy for them. But I think we're in a transition period now. It's different at every med school. I've seen some med schools that are really, I mean, med schools buy boards and beyond for their students. Some of them assign boards and beyond for their students. Uh, schools buy UWorld for their students. And we've got other schools that don't do any of those things at all. You know, they say those resources are, are not helpful. You need to come to class and learn from us. We're the only ones who know. So everybody's stuck in a different phase of this process. And I think it's just going to take time to work out. Um, and one thing I'll say is, you know, it's really easy to get your blood boiling as a med student and get all upset at this. Um, you have to pick your battles in life. And if you're a second year med student, the boards are six months away. Try not to focus too much on the fairness or unfairness of it. Just like get past that board exam. And, you know, when you're the dean, you can come back and, and you know, uh, raise hell and change everything. Right. 
But for now, you know, this is just the way it is, unfortunately. Yeah, it is the way it is right now. But, you know, as the years go by, I feel like the education system is changing. So you never know how things are going to look in the future. I agree. And so when somebody's taken step one and they move on to clinicals, are there ways for somebody to prepare for clinicals better? I know Boards and Beyond does preclinical education. Are there Boards and Beyond resources for the clinicals, the wards, and kind of how to excel on clerkships? Yeah, so um, take this with a grain of salt because I created Boards and Beyond. And what I'm about to tell you about is a Boards and Beyond resource. Um, but we launched a resource that we started building before I sold the company to McGraw-Hill and then McGraw-Hill took it over the finish line. It's called the Clinical Confidence Series. The videos were not made by me, so I'm not, at least, you know, I'm not self-promoting my own videos, but they are videos that teach you all the things you need to know for clinicals that you didn't learn preparing for step one. So I'll give you an example. I had a student of mine who was an excellent student, did great on step one. He ended up going into dermatology. And the first day of his medicine rotation, his attending said, what do you want to do for this patient with high blood glucose? And if you've done UWorld questions or MBME, you know the first answer is always metformin, right? That's the first line drug for diabetes. And that's what he said. But no one ever told him that in the hospital, we never use oral drugs for diabetes. We always use insulin, right? Um, so this is the kind of thing that you're not going to learn from studying for step one. He also told me when he went into the operating room, they said, can you hand me such and such a tool? And no one had ever taught him the names <laughs> of all the tools in the operating room. And Many of his patients had different types of IV lines. They had cortices and triple lumens and pick lines, and he didn't know what any of these things were. And this has been true since I was in med school. You basically just spend your first few weeks or months on clinical rotations, embarrassing yourself by asking, what are all these basic things that everyone seems to know, but no one ever told me. So the clinical confidence series is built around those principles. It's for There's one for pediatrics, one for OB, one for surgery, one for hospital medicine. And they teach you all those things you need to know. And the students that have used it have told me this helped them be a superstar in rotations uh, because they just knew stuff. They knew like how, what the different diet orders were. You know, they knew what to order at the time of discharge. Uh, they knew how to schedule follow-up appointments. These are all things outside the scope of board exams. You would never see a question about any of these things in board exams, but they're part of what you need to know to function in the clinics and the hospital. So I think that's a great way to get ready. And a lot of students who, it's a very new resource, only been out about a year, but the students who've used it have given us fantastic feedback. I think it's just waiting to pop. It's still not that well known, but the more people that find out about it, the bigger it will get. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, like you said, it's one thing knowing the actual, you know, ins and outs of medical pathways, like biochemical pathways and different mechanisms of actions, but it's completely different to then go talk to the patient and then order the right tests in the sense of like, how do we actually approach this clinical situation? So being yeah. confident on the wards is a completely different ball game than being confident preclinically. So it sounds like a really great resource, um, which is- awesome. I remember being asked to order an OT consult on a patient and I had no idea what OT meant. Uh, it means occupational therapy. And you know, if, you sp if you're an intern, you'll know this cold by your third month of internship. But, you know, as a third year med student, I'd never even heard that. And I just nodded my head like, yeah, sure, I'll order it, of course. But I had no idea what they're talking about. Uh, so this is, these videos are designed to help you with that problem. Awesome. And you also wrote a book, right? I Talk did. Yeah. That. Thank you for asking. Um, I wrote a book. It's a novel. It's a fictional story. It's called The Gunner. Uh, it's a fictional story about a med student who sets her sights on a lucrative career in dermatology and tries to do everything she can to get ahead in medical school. She's a first-gen med student. Um, it's a satire. It's modeled after House of God, which some of you may know is a book from the 1980s, a satire of internship and internal medicine. Um, it's been out for about six months. The reviews have been good. I think if you're a med student, you'd find it very funny. And uh, I appreciate you bringing up, Dan. Uh, I'm very proud of this story. It took me a long time to write it. It's always something I wanted to do is write a book. So uh, if you're interested, The Gunner, it's on amazon.com. Yeah, perfect. And we have a couple minutes um, left for a few last minute questions, which we can look through the Q&A as well. If anybody has any last minute questions for um, for Dr. Ryan, it looks like somebody actually just asked a little bit about, you know, somebody struggling with physical examinations and history taking, if you're going to be making videos about things like that. So it sounds like the answer is yes with uh, what we just heard about. Um, yeah. and, you know, Medical school is 
overall such an anxiety inducing and just difficult long journey and just a career in medicine is as well. So you have everybody watching you right now, listening and beyond just watching your videos for boards and beyond what overall overarching advice do you have somebody who, you know, obviously wants to be a successful physician and have a good career. You know, you have everybody watching right now. What kind of advice would you give to somebody who's just, you know, in medical school, wants to do well in medical school and beyond, you know, as somebody who's kind of gone through the process, what advice would you give? Yeah, the funny thing about, so the things that make me happiest about medicine and that have kept me happy throughout my career are when I focus on the patient and remind myself that it's a service profession. It's about helping the sick. It's about helping people in times of need and service to others. When I think about medicine like that, I'm usually very satisfied and very happy. When I start to think about medicine in terms of board scores, residency, uh, salary, promotion in academics, publications, these are the things that start to burn me out and get me down. So one piece of advice, and I share this a lot on my Twitter account with students, is to just like, whenever you can, try to remember that you got into this profession to help people and you're going to be part a very special profession where you get to see people in times of extreme need and really play an incredible role in their lives. Uh, and that this is an amazing profession about service to others. And boy, the more you can focus on that and just forget about competing with your classmates, that's actually a huge theme in the gunner is that as she pursues this lucrative career, she forgets about medicine as a profession of service to others. And it's always been a passion of mine to remind students that you know, there may be clinic patient number 18 for me, but for them, it's a huge deal. They're seeing a heart doctor for their heart condition. They've been waiting two weeks for this appointment. They don't know what I'm going to say. High stakes moment for them. And part of my job is to play that role. And I'm very privileged to, to get to do that. And that's really the best part of medicine for me. Absolutely. And we have two minutes left. So I just want to, I see a lot of people on who are um, asking about things like the MCAT and getting into medical school. So I I want to uh, address all the pre-meds who are watching. Dr. Ryan, if somebody's a pre-med who's watching and hasn't even gotten into medical school but knows that they want to, what advice yeah. would you have, like in, in one minute, I know this is tough to do, but what advice would you have for a pre-med who wants to become a physician, who wants to get into medical school? Because everything is just so competitive these days. And as bad as I feel for med students and what they have to go through, I feel even worse for pre-med students. I mean, the pressure to get good grades, good MCATs, to publish 19 different papers uh, and to go to some uh, country and dig you know, ditches and build homes for people who live in the middle of nowhere. The pressure is just enormous. It's really ridiculous. Uh, you know, I want people to come to medical school who are just good people who wanna have a strong career in medicine and help others. I don't really care that much if you have 19 publications or have gone flown around the world to do all sorts of community service projects. Those things are nice, but I don't think they're essential. Um, but this is the way the game is played these days. Talk to your pre-med advisor, find out what students from your school who have gotten into med school have done and just follow the path that they've blazed for you. The easiest way into med school is to follow people who've gone through it at, from your college for the last 10 years and do exactly what they did. Yeah, awesome. Well, we're nearing the end and I wanna be respectful of your time and everyone's time. Thank you so much, Dr. Ryan, for joining and for presenting and telling us about kind of how to do well on the boards and beyond. Um, and also for telling us about boards and beyond. Um, but okay. then also for everyone who's watching, this will be sent to you within the next 24 hours, this recorded video. We got through a lot of questions. So Dr. Ryan, thank you so much again. Um, if there's anything that people have additional questions for, you guys have that QR code. You could also always email us or kind of we'll try to be as helpful as we possibly can. But Dr. Ryan, Thank you. Thank you so much for all of your time. This is incredibly helpful. And thank you for all of you for joining and spending your evening with us. So wish you all, you guys all the best. And thank you so much again, Dr. Ryan. Yeah. Good luck to all you guys. Hang in there. I know it's tough. You will get through it. I felt just like you did back in the day and it will work out. Take care, guys.